Well, it's good to see you again, folks that came in. My wife and I are from Kannapolis, North Carolina, and uh, been saved 36 years, married 35 years, and on the 30th anniversary, uh, Rhonda says, what does the book say you're supposed to have on your 30th anniversary? I said, well, it says here a roast duck. She said, well, I don't see any sense to kill innocent ducks like that happened 30 years ago. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. She don't really say that, but I tell that on her anyway. But um, this message this morning will be unusual. And it you may or may not have heard it, but... I vow before the Lord this morning that what I'm going to tell you is truth. This involves your heritage, not only your heritage, but the heritage of the Bible that you got on your lap. Amen. I want you to remember this the whole time that I'm preaching this morning, that the God of the Bible is the God of history. Amen. And the God of the history is the God of the Bible. The reason why that's so important is because there's a faction out in the world today that is trying to tell you that the God of the Old Testament is not the same God of the New Testament. That's right. That the God of the Old Testament was a tribal deity of Israel, but the God of the New Testament is a God of love and affection. Folks, it's the same God. That's right. He manifests himself in different ways. He's a God of love. He's also a God of wrath. God loves because he hates. Mm -hmm. He loves because he hates sin. And he knows what it does to man. He knows what it did to Adam and Eve. But we'll be in Psalm 107 this morning. And I will uh, I will try to be this is this I guess, what's the word I'm trying to say? I'll try to be just as plain as I can be. Some of this, the facts and stuff on this can be a little bit overwhelming, but they are to me. I have a hard time remembering everything when I get up here, but uh, every time I do this. But this is probably one of the most important uh, messages that I preach. Now, folks, as I told you in Sunday school, I preach you know messages. My messages are simple. They're simple outline, five, usually five-point outline messages. And I preach, uh, uh, I'm an evangelist, that's what I do. But this, the King James Bible and Baptist history, uh, Baptist history is really not my forte, it's my pastor's. He's probably the best in the country on that subject. But um, you find that they go together like this. Yep. You can't have Baptist history without Bible history and vice versa. And we're going to see that this morning. Now several things that I say may raise your eyebrows. You know, you think, does he know what he's talking about? Or does he know what he said? But if you'll go home and check the Encyclopedia Britannica or the World Book, you'll find some of the stuff we're going to be dealing with this morning. Now, the reason why this map is here is it's not a geography lesson, but it's going to show you the location of where some of these things took place. And that will greatly enhance what you learned this morning. I hope when we go out of here in just a few, few short minutes, that we will not only love our Bible more than we do, but we'll love our heritage. Amen. Okay? So, let's get started. And you pray for me this morning. Psalm 107. Psalm 107, beginning with verse number 21. Psalm 107, 21. The Bible says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man that are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. 
So he bringeth them into the desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Father, give us wisdom now. Help us, Heavenly Father, Lord God, to understand and Father, to grasp and to digest what we're going to learn this morning. I want to be a blessing to these folks. They're my brothers and my sisters in Christ. And Father, I pray that you won't let anything come out of my mouth that is not the truth this morning. And we'll thank you and praise you for that in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I want to preach this morning on stay the course. C-O-U-R-S-E, stay the course. As far as we know, the first King James Bible didn't come to America until 1630. The King James Bible was translated in England from 1604 to 1611. It took seven years, of course. You know that's God's number of completion. It was the seventh printed English translation, which is another seven connected with right. it. Fifty-four men were originally commissioned to translate the King James Bible. Forty-seven wound up. Uh, finishing the work, which is, if I'm not mistaken, my elementary education didn't fail me, that's minus seven. So you got three sevens connected with the King James Bible right there. But in 1630, Governor John Winthrop, Massachusetts Bay Colony, Salem Harbor, brought the first King James Bible to America. Now, in 1620, when the pilgrims came over here to America, they did not bring the King James Bible. They brought the Geneva Bible, the Bible of the Reformers of 1560. The Geneva Bible had many anti-Roman Catholic notes in the margins of the whole Bible. And so, when the King James Bible was translated, King James, who was King James uh, the Sixth of Scotland, became King James I of England. He was the first of the Stuart kings on the throne in England. When he came uh, on the throne, one of the first things he did was talk to the Puritan delegation and those others there in the, uh, the uh, parliament and those there in the churches in England. And they gave unto him what is known as the millinery petition. The millinery petition was a, is a petition of a thousand names wanting a, another Bible translation because of the fact that uh, some of the earlier ones were deemed in the eyes of some to be faulty. They were going to uh, revised the Bishop's Bible of 1568. That was their, their original intent. But they did have on the table, the King James translators did, all the former early English translations from the same line of manuscript. Now the reason why it's very important is because this was an undertaking that God was going to put his hand on and was going to be dealing with in a very special way. We're dealing with, uh, we're starting January of 1604 is when the King James Bible be translated, began to be translated. So remember that in your mind. Now the reason why, the reason why the pilgrims were suspicious of the King James Bible is because James commissioned the first King James Bible, the original edition, and all subsequent editions not to have any reference notes in the margins except for scripture references and maybe an alternate word every once in a while. But he would not, did not want any notes in the margins. So the pilgrims naturally thought, since James was Presbyterian and that England was governed by the Church of England, that it was high church, they thought the King James Bible was high church, that it was pro-Catholic, that it leaned toward Catholicism. So they didn't trust it. And they, they, they said, we can't accept the King James Bible because that will stay with the Geneva Bible, 1560. Until they began to see this dedicatory that's in front of many of your King James Bibles. It was in the original edition. And it needs to be in all printed King James Amen. Bibles. But you'll, when I get ready to quote a portion of it here, you'll see why they left it out. But the King James translators began to see in Europe and Asia the power of the King James Bible as it was being preached. And they saw the intrinsic the uh, value of that book and the fact that God's breath was on it and God's hand was on it. Not only that, they read the dedicatory. toward it. It said, lest we be traduced by popish persons at home or abroad or malign us, for we are poor in instruments to make God's truth to be yet more and more known unto the people, or lest we be maligned by self-conceited brethren who run their own ways and give liking unto nothing which was framed, or hammer, framed by themselves and hammered on their anvil. 
He said they desire to still keep them in ignorance and in darkness. Mm -hmm. They said, wait a minute, this is not a pro-Catholic book at all. This is God's book. Folks, I'm telling you, the King James translators could see the Puritans on this side that would burn you at the stake, and if you don't believe that, go to Smithfield, England today, look at the monuments of those that were burned by the Puritans. Or look at the Catholics who've been noted for burning people at the stake. They said, we better stay right here with this book, and that's exactly what they did. Now, people don't like to hear that kind of thing, folks, but facts are stubborn things. You can't change the truth unless you come out with uh, unless you come out with, with covenant theology or replacement theology or revisionist history. And God's not pleased with that. Amen. But listen to me. Through the preaching of this King James Bible, in Europe and Asia, which is this is what this is a map of, in, in Europe and Asia, Asia over here, Europe here, and we'll be dealing with this in just a minute. But they began to see the power of that book, and then as it came to America in 1630, they watched the King James Bible as it came to America. People getting saved by the hundreds and by the thousands. Baptists were over in England preaching the Word of God, and every time they'd say, Thus saith the Lord, they'd stick them in jail over there in England by the droves. Every time a Baptist would open his mouth, they'd stick him in jail. Amen. And folks, things didn't change when they got over here either. That's when right. the Baptists came to America, every time they would open their mouth, they'd stick them in jail. In America, the United States of America. That's right. Now listen, through the preaching of this King James Bible, by 1644 in America, the Geneva Bible went out of circulation, and the King James Bible ascended the throne. Something happened, folks, in six, by 1639-1640 that had never been in any place in the history of the world. Number one, the first continuing Baptist church began in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, under John Clark. Then you had the Portsmouth Compact, which was a de declaration of complete religious liberty in a state, Rhode Island. And then you had the King James Bible. Those three things began to spread in the 13 colonies of America as the colonies began to multiply. That would never existed in any country on the face of God's earth. Here in the United States of America. As that first Baptist church there in uh, Rhode Island was formed, right across from it, right across from it became the first Jewish synagogue. So the Jewish people who had fled persecution in Europe came over here and enjoyed religious freedom in America building their first synagogue. I think it was the Toro Synagogue right across the street from the First Baptist Church. Do you think that's a coincidence? I had a, a Jewish person tell me, he's a, he's a Messianic Jew, told me the other day that we Baptists were the worst there are about replacement theology. And I said, sir, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. I said, we're not under the Old Testament law. We're under grace in the church age. But anyway, uh, I, I said, you know, the, the, the Jews wouldn't have their freedom to worship here if it wouldn't have been for the religious liberty brought to this Amen. country by the Baptists. Now you say, well, now, brother, man, now, just, 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 just wait a minute. I'm not done. Folks, listen. The Word of God began to be preached in this country and began to be preached in this country, and the Baptists were coming over here from England doing the same thing, fleeing persecution from the Church of England. They came to America, and they got over here around the Congregationalists, and they were doing the same thing to the Baptists over here in America. The congregational churches were. And every time a Baptist would get on the street and preach or get in the pulpit and preach, they'd come in and drag him out of, put him in jail or drag him out. They were drowning them, dunking them down in water and holding them down till they drowned them. They'd say, you want to be immersed? We'll immerse you. And they immersed them and drowned them. They were killing them in America. That's right. In the 1600s. 